sweet. Sweet. Well, I'm very, very excited to introduce uh, today's speaker, J.D. Botma. He works for an incredible organization called Open Up. And if you don't know about them already, you really should take a look um, at what they get up to. They're a organization that um, promotes empowering people and gov governance through, da uh, through data, technology, and innovative thinking. They also are the hosts of an incredible meetup based in Cape Town called um, Tech for Good Codebridge Newlands. Uh, you can find them in the Slack channel on ZA Tech. Um, and it's one of the best meetups that exist in the whole of Cape Town. Uh, so if you're lucky enough to live in Cape Town and attend them, uh, you really should. And as far as I know, they're, they're usually hosting all sorts of um, online meetups. So they're an incredible organization. And JD has been working there for, for quite a while. Uh, he's a senior developer who cares a lot about making sure that tech is accessible to people, which is a, yeah, it's an incredible commitment. And um, I'm extremely excited to hear about how they get work done and open up. And they're using technology like Webflow, which is just to create, you know, a tool to create websites and then Python Django backends for, uh, you know, wrangling the data and doing um, uh, amazing things. Like I know they worked on, um, a medicines price registry so they take this terrible spreadsheet that was given to them by the government and they put it into an impressive api and they make sure that people can access medical data that's one of the things i know about i know they do things like this for making sure that the the law is accessible for people um so there's all sorts of projects i'm sure we'll get to hear a little bit about them today and a little bit about the process and so thank you so much for contributing to PyCon today this year jd it's lovely to, to see you cool Thanks. Um, should I get started? Hello? Uh, hey, yes, I can hear you now. Sorry about that. Uh, you're a presenter and take it away. Okay, oh, wrong button. Sorry, I, I practiced this. Uh, where do I share screen from? Because I think the button's gone. Uh, share your screen. There it is. Um, okay, entire screen. It's not showing my Firefox. Um, so let's make a plan. What's going on? Sorry, I did try this before. Let's try it like this instead. Um, allow, and then that's better. That's better. Okay. Um, hi. Um, yes, I'm JD. Thank you for the l lovely introduction. Um, um just one second, sorry, JD, your screen share started and then ended immediately. So could you just try to uh, retry that? Sure, thanks. Um, that's the wrong one. Let's try that again, allow. That's working on my side. Great, okay, cool, we're, we're there. Thanks so much for the for the introduction. I I really love PyCon. Um, it's it's really nice to be here. Um, it's one of the coolest places to to meet people, and we've we've met some really nice uh, people who've, who've then joined our our community. Um, so uh, yeah, it's always fun to to be to be speaking here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I uh, I'm sorry for the cryptic title. I I'm gonna tell you about a month in in my life or our lives. Um, I'll tell you why I call us the people who sprinkle technology. Um, and um, I'll share a couple of tools. Um, one is actually a programming tool, and one is more a tool that, that we use to communicate in our team and with, with the people we work with. Um, and what I really want to do is, is share from, I think, a very interesting context where we're working with um, a whole range of, of different kinds of people um, in government, in um, in, in civil society uh, organizations who are trying to, to better the, the, the world. Um, and um, that makes 
uh, I think, for for a very fun and, and interesting context to be working. Um, so, um, yeah, I think the the first thing I'll, I'll talk about is is just who we are. Then um, Webflow, what it is, um, how we use it to build front ends, and I as a, a, a a Django developer as a backend developer, it feels like it gives me superpowers. Um, and um, then I'll, I'll talk about that, that user-centered design approach or, or the, the communication tool we're using. And uh, finally, how to kind of uh, join if you'd like to sprinkle tech as well. Um, so OpenApp's vision is a South Africa where citizens and government are empowered to thrive collaboratively. We very much believe that um, citizens should get involved in governance and um, and the people in government, there are many who are keen to kind of um, make things work, um, to get them in touch and working together. Uh, that's the, the, the world where we want to be. Um, so our mission is that we seek to empower people and government through data, technology, and innovation, innovative thinking to become active agents in creating positive social change. We don't believe in solving people's problems for them uh, because that's not very sustainable because that goes away if we go away. Um, it's much more scalable if we can have people sort of um, take take charge of, of their own issues. Um, and we work with more than just technology and coding. It's it's also about applying some of the, the, the tools we have like agile and, and systems thinking um, from the software development world um, to, uh, to a lot of these problems, and, and they can contribute a lot. Um, we tend not to work with big data. Uh, we tend to work with just a little bit of data, uh, maybe 100 or 100,000 rows. And, but we try to make that really accessible and make that actually meaningful to, to people who aren't data experts um, and, and bring that value out of, of, of them, which takes a lot of thinking and and less serious heavy data analysis um, or big data skills. So that just gives you a bit of a, the background of, of um, sort of how we approach a lot of these problems and, and why we're then doing, um, why we need tools like this. So the, uh, the problem we had when we were building user interfaces is that user experience is really important like in some projects you can get away with with just making information available in a like the bare bones most bare bones way but um a lot of what we do ux is actually super important and even aesthetics like you can't just throw a, a bootstrap um uh star shoot on there uh which is what i love to do for my own project um but there's real value in, in the design being compelling and uh unique and and recognizable um, so sometimes that is actually worth quite a lot of effort, um, even when it's just just a for good project. Um, we want to give the designer then uh, as much freedom as possible to design those compelling, convenient widgets and interfaces. And pushing pixels takes time and money, and um, not just like is the margin there just right, but more like. Um, is the interaction working at the way it should? Is it responsive and doing the right thing in the right places? And if a, a developer is struggling to get something to match a design, you have to make compromises. And if they make those compromises by themselves, they might lose the intent from the design. And if they need to kind of constantly have conversations with the designer, um, that that is 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 challenging. But we wanted to bring the, that process of building the, the front end as, as close to the, um, the design as possible. We wanted to like, reduce that, that cycle as, as much as possible. So we were asking, can we give the designer complete freedom and then actually build that? So I should say, we don't get any money from Webflow for, um, for, for plugging them. We're not plugging them. We just really love the tool. Um, I say it's like Wix, but awesome. I, I don't really know Wix that well, but like I think it's similar to Dreamweaver maybe, and Dreamweaver's output wasn't exactly very reusable um, back in the day. So um, we're pretty excited about Webflow. So it's a very visual way of, of building an actual website. Um, what you see on the left is the sort of devs and containers and, and H1s, and you really have control of what, which elements you're putting using to put together a site. 
And on the right hand side, you can see uh, styling that would then go into style sheets. And um, that hero heading at the top is a class. So you have complete control over the class names, over um, um, over sort of curating a well put together site that is maintainable in the long run. Um, and then when you publish this, you can host it on Webflow. Um, and if you don't minimize the HTML, you actually get readable HTML out of it. And um, it maintains your class names and all of that. So you've got actually like a well-maintained um, markup and, and, and style sort of set, um, which you could then export. So we were wondering, can we design in Webflow instead of Figma and then add our data to it and make it uh, present our data as as attractively as we would like, as as accessibly as we would like, um, but be dynamic. And they have a, a CMS where where you can upload data, but it um, kind of um, it only really goes to about ten thousand records, which sometimes isn't enough for us. Like relationships between objects aren't great. It's designed for blogs and online shops. Really, it's not designed for kind of arbitrary sites. And we really want to kind of be able to do arbitrary things with, with data and do interesting things with data um, and then present it very accessibly. And I know Figma can now export CSS and HTML. I'm not sure how, how if it's on par, uh, but we've been doing this for, I think, about a year now. Um, so yeah, we were doing it before uh, Figma got there. Um, so the process works a bit like this. Now, this is one of my diagrams. It's um, not as nice as the designer would do things. Um, but you start off with your design in Webflow, and you can have this nice iterative cycle where you get this rich preview. You can actually publish it to a temporary to, to a staging site and and try try your site out, uh, see how it responds, and all of that. And then you can export the site as a zip file, and I'll show you a bit more about how that works, but um, and what that looks like. But the uh, basically we we wrote a little script um, in, import Webflow that you just give the the, the zip file, and it will then extract the static stuff into a folder where you specify and the HTML files, it can put into a temp, like wherever you want. Um, so we put them, when it's a Django project, we put them into the templates folder. Um, and as it's extracting them, you can also process those HTML files and do things that make it useful as HTML templates. So for example, you can insert a, a little script tag with your custom JavaScript um, that will then connect your, your static exported Webflow site to, to data, because now you can do whatever you want, pull data from an API or, or something like that. You can also insert um, uh, Django tags um, so that you can do, for example, meta tags so to make sure your site is set up for, for SEO, um, for search engine optimization, and for social sharing, and so on. And you can insert. Um, a script tag with some JSON embedded there, so your data is right in the page. You don't even need to reload. Uh, you, you don't even need to do an AJAX call to get your data. Um, you then deploy your Django site as usual. You do your server-side templating. You might pull data from an API. And on the client side, your, um, your custom JavaScript can then populate fields on the page. Um, and boom, you've got a dynamic site. and your users get to use your site, you get some feedback, and you get back to modifying the site. And now you can do the design changes that you need to do, export that, um, and import that back into your project. And you've got a very effective feedback loop of, of developing um, with this rapid prototyping of um, a visual website builder. Um, but this comes with a big caveat, you cannot manually edit that export. Um, and that's where our tool comes in. So you can't manually e edit that export because the next time you import it, it's going to overwrite your changes. So I'm sorry this is a node project. It was a, a Python tool to start with, but um, it made more sense as a node tool uh, when I kind of made it a bit more generic because it, you would tend to use it on the, the, the front end side. So if you do it, if you're just using an API, if it's not a Django server side project, um, 
then it would it might just be a, a JavaScript programmer who's who's building on this. So um, it made more sense there. Um, and I, I don't know if you know um, the package.json file, but basically your your Node.js um, tool framework um, configuration file for the for the front end uh, project. Um, you just need to add a key import Webflow export, and under that you can put the configuration for how you want that import done. So you decide which um, Django project um, and and app and which folders you want to to extract the the static files to, and um, this import HTML section specifies how to match HD, specific HTML files, uh, which directory to place them into, and you can optionally then transform them by um, a JavaScript module that um, it would then import and, and run on your um, um, on your templates to make sure that they're set up as Webflow templates, oh, sorry, as Django templates. Um, so just to look quickly what a Webflow export looks like. This is a bit simpler than the Django project I'm, I'm demonstrating, but um, it's pretty well structured. You get a CSS file with a project-specific CSS, a Webflow-specific CSS, a fonts folder, a, an images folder, um, an HTML file for every page you have in your Webflow site, and then a, a generated Webflow.js, um, which contains some sort of things that are specific to your project, but and and also jQuery gets gets pulled in by Webflow. Um, so it's it's pretty simple. It's pretty clear. Um, and our tool then just sort of takes the structure and, and uh, moves the files over to, to your web project uh, as you specify. Just to show you how one of those um, transform what one of those transformation functions looks like, this is this happens on in your development environment where you're you've downloaded the, the zip file and you want to kind of pull the, these changes into your site. Um, so. Um, you just export a, um, a function called transform. It gets a, a window object and a jQuery dollar. Um, and um, jQuery object on the, this dollar variable. And for some reason, using the, the jQuery approach for adding a script tag does weird things. So I use the window approach. And you create a script element. Uh, you set the, the source to be your, um, your JavaScript, your custom JavaScript. Um, you add it to the page. And then the import tool will will write that uh, write those changes to to file again, and it looks surprisingly much like the original, um, and so you end up only really seeing if you then look at your git status and um, add those changes. The the diff you get in in uh, git is really only the changes that happen in Webflow and the changes that ha that happen because of this. Um, these explicit transformations. Looking at a, a Django front end, then um, here's an example at vilekamali.gov.za, um, one of the sites we've we've used this for. Um, and this is basically this page represents a, an infrastructure project that's being built in, in Cape Town um, by the Western Cape government. And this page, there, there's a few thousand, I think 17,000 of these pages. Um, so it's very handy that it can be um, built server side, uh, which is really great for SEO on these on these projects to make them much more discoverable. Um, and then um, basically anything here that's data driven is injected by our um, client side custom JavaScript. but. The way this looks, uh, the way it responds, all of that is built in Webflow. Um, so as long as the, the classes for each of these fields where we template data in doesn't change, the designer can go and he can rearrange how this works and uh, how this looks and have quite a lot of freedom in, in sort of experimenting there. And it would still just keep working. Um, we would just need to export it from Webflow and import, and, and it keeps working. Um, when we, uh, this is a bit of a simplified version of how we import. I just took away the, the stuff where we check, it, check if something's missing and add and remove a class to make sure that kind of missing fields um, kind of look right, um, get, get uh, faded a little bit. Um, but basically, you just have a, um, a blob of data in the page um, project, and uh, you find the field, and you 
set the text of that field, text contents of that field. Um, and that's how the page gets populated. Here's an example where we're actually setting a breadcrumb uh, label and a breadcrumb link. Um, and um, if you click that, it'll do a search and take you back to the, the search page. So um, the sorts of transformations we do on Django projects then um, are to load static, um, the, the static tag, uh, rewriting asset paths to match the Django static path. Um, we insert those meta tags, insert our JavaScript bundle, and um, we uh, insert a, um, a, a JSON blob that's sort of the page context that we want to use client side. Um, and you don't need to be able to read this code, but it's, it's, it's a lot, it's kind of, it looks scary, but it's automated and that's the big thing. So the same transformations happen every time. So you only, unless you're changing these transformations, the only change you really see when you're importing another export is the changes that the designer made to the site, um, which, which is actually pretty cool. Um, I think I'm going to skip the, the, the tips and tricks. Um, the most important one here is, um, no, I think I'll, I'll skip forward because I'm a bit slow. Um, what we haven't done yet is connected this up to uh, front-end frameworks like Backbone.js or Vue. So we've just done written vanilla, um, um, vanilla JavaScript, um, which is not great if you're building a single page app that gets a bit complex. Um, so it would be nice to use a uh, a framework for that um, and but yeah so I think the best tip I want to give is use automated testing so you notice if if something is broken by a new import the next thing I want to talk about is um, our approach for user-centered design um, and how we get a whole bunch of people most of whom who have very little tech industry background to be on the same page in how we apply a lot of these processes and to kind of feel more comfortable with those processes. Um, and I want to share this um, because I, I'm hoping to learn from, from you if you have some, some suggestions. Uh, there are probably gaps, but it comes from trying to codify a process that we have that's kind of unspoken, but just trying to make it so that we know what we do and other people can kind of reapply that um, for how we work. And so this is very much how we try to tackle projects that open up. So the problem is that the client wants an app or the client says they want something, right? People usually come to you with a solution. And our organization has its vision. Our projects need to align to our vision. Um, eventually there's a contract which has deliverables. And we haven't necessarily spoken to users yet, right? Um, the team has memory loss. And by that, I mean, like you can work for a long time and lose track of why did we decide to do something in a certain way? Why did we prioritize this over this? Um, we, we at OpenUp don't have enough product owners. We're a small organization. We're working on many projects at the same time because everything is stop and start when you're collaborating with government and so many different organizations. Um, even if we did have enough product owners, the vision of a project needs to be clear. The user needs need to be clear and shared and understood by everyone on the project. That's so, so incredibly fundamental to us. Um, so I, I want to share this because I think as experienced developers, this is more and more important, I think, to a developer, especially as they, as they grow in, in, in seniority. Um, and it, this should um, tie in very nicely with Agile, but I'm, I'm not giving an Agile course now. So what I have an offer for you is a GitHub repository where you can find a, a, a deck of slides which contains those diagrams. I'm going to add the, the link to the, the Google Sheets, sorry, the Google Slides um, to that as well. Um, so just watch that if you're going there now. Um, the, the most important thing I think I want to get across is the diagrams and how we use them to have conversations and to drive this process. Um, and there's a YouTube video where I go in quite a lot more detail. Um, and it's Creative Commons. Please use it, modify it, extend it. Um, please cite us and please contribute back if you've got suggestions. So I mentioned there's a lot going on. Like under stakeholders and users, there, there could be 
a committee of government representatives or government and civil society representatives. There could be a ward councillor in a municipality or even a mayor, um, uh, a civil servant, just an official working in government and trying to make something work or just trying to get a pension. You know, like, um, there's a, uh, you might work with a journalist or an activist or any combination of these things on a, on a project. Um, somehow there needs to be this, this kind of central idea, a single vision um, that needs to kind of tie together all of those ideas and needs, but also really those of the users, the budget constraints and, and massage that into a backlog. Um, you're constrained by what the data can do, but you also need to see what opportunities are in the data, which is why technologists need to work so close to these other people, because you need to make that connection to what those people who understand a, a specific problem better than you do. Um, you need to kind of ex like brush shoulders with them to to uh, make those make those links, um, and and yeah. So th that's why this is this is quite important to to me. And this is really it. This is a a, a simplified version that we can use in quite a few ways. Um, but fundamentally, it's a process that's more of a dependency diagram than a like a temporal flowchart or something like that. Um, Fundamentally, you need to understand your intended outcome. Once you know that, you can start looking at who's involved. Like if you try to build and try stuff, and this is where we do the agile, like let's do an iteration and let's evaluate it and let's iterate on that and evaluate and so on. But it's, it's, very, it's a bad idea to do that if you have no idea what your intended outcome is or who your, your intended users are. So, the, the dark boxes here are supposed to just give us, it's, it's not a technical term or any, any of these things, it's uh, just a label for the concept of what this area is trying to explore. The lighter boxes, and I'll, I'll, they, they kind of expand in a bit more granular, granular fashion uh, on the next slide, um, are artifacts that are try to be more technical terms, which you could look up and Google how to kind of, how those work, how you use them, how you prepare them. Um, and, um, and and they try to kind of be our, our anchor points that we use to kind of refer back to um, when we kind of need to lean on what is our intended outcome again. So under intended outcome, you might prepare a project vision and objectives. And a vision like our organizational vision is very lofty and like one day this would be very nice um, while your objectives might be more concrete. Your personas, might help you kind of have stereotypes of the sorts of users, persons that you're intending for, for this thing to be used by. Um, and if you make, if you, if you document those as artifacts, it's very nice to be able to refer back to that and go, okay, that's the intended outcome. These are the users. This is their nature. This is how I would design and build for them. Um, so these two can kind of happen in parallel, but um, the one is mapping the as is. What's the state of the world? What information exists? Um, how do the intended audience understand that information? How would you arrange that information so that they would find it and where, where they would go looking for it rather than just where it conceptually fits? Um, whereas how could users succeed? Uh, looking at storyboards and user journeys, um, and I'm so excited about storyboarding uh, for projects because it's, it's yeah it's just a very very powerful tool. Um, maps the to be. How would someone go from where they are with facing a certain problem to where they want to be, where that problem has been resolved, and then figuring out what can we do somewhere in that, and how do we connect them along that way so that they persist on that journey and get get that done. And you're also preparing a backlog under here. And now you've got a backlog. Now you know what's a high priority thing and a relevant thing to your intended users. You, then you build it and you still recognize in agile fashion that you probably don't understand the problem as well as you thought you did. So you would always go back and update any of these as you learn more. Um, but now you've got a good footing for, for that. Um, so I'm, I'm running out of time, but I want to touch on a few questions. And this is what I think is, is one of the, the very useful parts of this. Um, 
th this isn't the only way. These aren't the only questions you need to ask. Under each of these artifacts um, and and their kind of neighborhood of, of tools, um, you can um, you can find a um, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of ways of, of approaching this, but I think these questions are a really good way. Like, you'd you'd already be in a better position if you as a project team just sit and ask these questions. So, under the intended outcome, you might ask, "What do we want to achieve?" Obviously, um, why do we think that our idea, the solution that we started with, or, or hopefully didn't, but often start with, why do we think that's going to achieve our intended outcome? If if this is coming from a client, we need to ask, like, should we help the client with this stage? Should we tell them, or should we just take their money? And we usually don't, because then it's not going to align with our vision, usually. But should we help them figure out this, this stuff of what they're actually trying to achieve? And just make that concrete and clear, and make sure everyone is on the same page with that. Under who is involved, like, what motivates those users? Uh, why would they get involved with whatever you're, you're trying to do? What, what are you trying to build, if it's a website or an app? Under what's the state of the world? Um, the obvious question is what data is available, what information is available. Um, are there similar approaches or tools or things that already exist um, to what we have in mind? But also what mechanisms exist, like being able to vote is a mechanism. Um, being able to, um, to uh, escalate something to the right person when something isn't working in a, in a government department or in your municipality, uh, that's a mechanism. And, you can then look at how do you make that mechanism accessible to people. Um, how could users succeed? You, you'd be asking like where users are located physically, but also like where are they? What's what's the problem? Like where are you finding them? Are you finding them sort of down, and frustrated, or are you finding them sort of energized and ready to take something difficult on? Um, how how would they find your work? And that's something that that comes out of um, storyboards uh, quite nicely. And then under building and trying, like the obvious things from, from Agile, what's the smallest thing we can do to validate our idea? Uh, what's the core feature and what can wait till later? Um, and an important one under evaluate, there's the user testing questions, but then there's also what have we misunderstood? So as much as I knock a client from coming to you with a solution and saying, build this, whether it connects to the user or not, the, the client does understand the problem area better than you do, quite likely. And you might have misunderstood something. And so it's very valuable to actually know when you do need to really like stop and, and listen to them. So I'll skip future work. Um, I think this is a good place to pause. I've got a bunch more slides um, if we have questions. Um, if you like what I'm talking about and you'd like to get involved, um, please join our community um, on meetup.com slash codebridge. Um, we're online as well as in person now, thanks to COVID. Uh, we might be in person again soon um, on ZX Slack Codebridge Newlands. And we're looking for senior developers who can help be the lead developer on projects um, and be the person who helps figure out how's the data going to connect to those needs and going to satisfy those needs or, or help with that. Um, what what tooling can we build? How do we build a, a, a simple thing that, that is just going to be a helper for a bigger sy systematic uh, issue that we're trying to address? Um, and um, and we tend to work on a, on a contract basis just because um, our work is quite stop start. We might have no projects and then we have 10 projects. Um, but please get in touch. Uh, we would really like to to meet some people and build up a community of people who who are keen and and able. Um, thank you very much. I think I'm ready to take questions. Thanks so much, um, JD. That was an amazing presentation. Um, I'm going to just steal the presenter rights for a moment. Yes, feels good. Is, is that an authentic PyCon <laughs> recording?
yes. This is the PyCon applause. Um, anyway, I just wanted to say thanks for your for your talk. It was um, really insightful. I think one of the things that I really enjoyed being pointed out there is that the people who best know the data um, are, you know, often the activist or the client or the end user, and being able for uh, the technologists or devs to be able to gain that kind of insight um, and feed that back to those stakeholders is is really really important. Um, and so, yeah, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, Dirk is asking, are you using JS DOM or headless browsers to make to add your code to the DOM? JS DOM. Okay. Was there any particular reason behind that? Um, I needed something that could work on the DOM and um, that I could serialize again. And um, I looked for the best maintained uh, oldest uh, thing that would be very robust and not just something that someone wrote last week. Um, and it does a, a really great job other than the, the quirk of adding a script tag both to the head and the body when I'm using jQuery to add. Um, I see. And I just want to check if there's any other questions. Um, pe some peeps are typing. Um, are there any other? So that tool that you use, that npm package, that's available. Is that something that's available for external use? Um, like other people can try out that tool, or is that an internal tool? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's on. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what NPM. the URL is. But it's on, on NPM, um, and it's open source, so uh, contributions are very welcome. Um, I don't know if anyone else has used it yet, so I've just quickly applied it to a few projects. Um, uh, yeah. Nice. Um, I wasn't aware that the Tech for Good meetups were happening online uh, still, so that's really nice to know. And I also need to update my email in meetup.com, clearly. <laughs> so um, everyone, please, uh, I, I highly recommend directing you to the meetup.com tech for good page, uh, where you can collaborate with all the people from, from open up and join uh, their online community until they can actually meet in person again. But um, they're a really, really welcoming group of people who are able to try and help solve big and interesting problems. Um, I'm just checking the chat here for a second. From a product owner's perspective, how do you guys deal with lack of ownership or owners that just don't have time or the knowledge to drive the project? I, I think that's very much where this, um, this came from. Um, people who, the, the, the people we, we had, some of the people we had trying to play the role of product owner didn't necessarily understand, like even if you do an agile sort of introduction, they don't re really understand all of the practices that go into being a product owner. Um, so they don't understand like, um, how do you do user research? So I wanted to kind of make those things, like I knew what it looked like from a developer's perspective of when you haven't done good user research, what it looks like, but I wasn't sure really how to do that. So I've been with, with the rest of the team trying to explore that uh, with, with um, uh, a UX company called, called Pondo. Um, who are, are really awesome and have helped us a lot. Um, and um, so, so yeah, it was trying to kind of take those things that we from the tech industry take for granted and, and make that clear to them. Because I think it's the kind of lack of ownership or the feeling of, of that not realizing that, it, that those things not being done as, as uh, effectively as I think is, is really necessary largely came from... Um, people not understanding what goes into it because they, they tend to come from a traditional project management space of going, okay, this is the project, this is the period, this is how we break it up into pieces um, and not realizing like, no, you really have to dig into what those users need. Um, so this, this, all of these processes of like user journeys, um, storyboarding, um, uh, information architecture as a process and not just a, a chart on the wall uh, personas and like researching and defining those personas, all of that stuff really help elicit a lot of those things. And um, yeah, that's that's where it comes from. 
Nice. So I guess what's nice is also you get to transfer a whole bunch of that knowledge to other clients as you work with them um, and do a bit of an education project on that side. Um, Caitlin is asking, how easy is it to make a responsive front end in Webflow? So being able to design for different scales and device sizes. At the top of the designer, um, there's buttons to go to different sizes, but you can also just like resize it like a browser. And um, it's got some fixed breakpoints. I'm not, I don't think you can change those breakpoints, but basically, long story short, according to our designer, it's very easy um, because it, it, it's like very much built into the tool to be able to make things responsive. I don't think it does it for you, but, but you, you still have to make those, those like CSS decisions, but uh, it provides a lot of support. Cool. And uh, Stefan is asking, how can you rough, um, can you say how many, roughly how many product, products each owner owns? Um, I guess it's, it's hard because our product ownership is so vague already, but let's say in the region of five ongoing, but our projects vary between like a three year multi-million rand project to a four week um 20,000 rand project kind of thing um none of those are like a whole team of five to nine people full time they're all like uh, working on this working on this at the same time so yeah it our context is a little bit different from industry cool. and we've got another question here how long does each project last roughly i guess in some ways that answered your question it can be very variable um so one question that I had is uh, when you're dealing with government, are there any, um, you know, it's, you guys at Open Up are taking on quite a big challenge where you're trying to create uh, projects for the government and there's issues around um, IP assignment. How do, you, how do you guys at Open Up manage to um, sort of get funding from a donor, de develop the IP and then transition that to that being, to, to the government actually owning that um, as a product themselves? Is there anything you can comment on that side? Our government owned projects tend to be funded by them, while our um, grant funded projects tend to be funded uh, owned by us or whoever uh, has the grant. Um, so government might get grants from uh, development agencies just like we might, but uh, yeah. So with with government, like the, the great thing is that I think every government project we've done has been open source. Um, and they've been nervous about it, but it's it's actually gone through so that it's always open source. Sometimes with a big disclaimer of how you're allowed to use it and stuff, but but it's still like MIT license uh, across the board. Um, the so I think ownership. Um, it usually they want to own it, um, and I think it's usually from fairly well informed um, people who 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 want to make sure that they they don't have lock in and there i think the the open source argument for like you're not going to be locked in it's open source we can't take this away from you you can get other vendors who know the this technology stack um that that's where open source really really helps nice uh well i think that's that's everything from the question side of things um so just on the moderation side of things we have uh, uh, Rick De Silva, who's going to be in this room um, next up the short break, which is building a, silver, a serverless computation environment with Python. So if you're interested in serverless, um, come and check out that talk. And otherwise, we're going to be having a break from now until 1.15. Thanks so much uh, for everybody joining. Oh. And yeah, JD's just popped his email in there. You can chat to him probably on Discord and, um, and if you have more questions. And um, yeah, just go and take a look at open, openup.org.za. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for presenting. Thank you for the opportunity. Nice to see you again. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Okay, bye everyone.